Welcome to Saddleback Church, and thank you so much for being with us here this week online. I want to ask you right now, if this is your first time checking this out, you know, maybe you are kind of watching on YouTube and you just clicked on an ad and for some reason you found yourself here, make sure you scan that QR code and learn how to download the Saddleback Church app. On that app, you can get message notes and find out about events that are happening online. And we would love to make sure you have the Saddleback Church app and the digital program that so you can follow along however, wherever you're at. Uh, one of the things when you actually go to the digital program, I want to make sure you check in with us. If you're watching on YouTube, you can actually go to the link in the description, click on that, check in with us and say, this is my first time stopping by. We would love to hear more about your story, how you found us, and maybe share a little bit more about how you can get plugged in at one of our campuses in Southern California or internationally, or maybe even online. We have a bunch of resources beyond just watching the worship service. You can actually get plugged into our community, but that starts with you kind of moving from somebody who's just watching to somebody who's actually engaging. So make sure you download the Saddleback Church app, scan that QR code, or hit the link in the description on YouTube. One of the things that's coming up is Activate Step 1, which is all about belonging to our church family. We host this uh, at all of our campuses, and we even host it online on Zoom. We have two options coming up, April 28th at 2 p.m. Pacific. Also another one, May 3rd, that's a Friday at 5 p.m. Pacific. And if you live in Asia, that's kind of set up to be your Saturday morning. So we're doing two options, just pick one of them. And if you've been watching online regularly and you're like, hey, I wanna do more. And, and I know there's many of you because we have tens of thousands of people that watch every week. Activate is a great chance to hang out with me and the online team, meet others in the community. We do breakout rooms, share a little bit more about our church family. And yes, you can engage with us online. And so you can get all that info by going to the digital program in the app or you know, click that link in the description. Make sure you sign up for one of those Activate Zoom sessions that's coming up. We would love to see you there. Now, we're going to move into a moment. Throughout this whole series, we've been the promise of peace. We've been kind of reflecting and meditating on some scripture as we go into worship and go into the message. And so we're just going to take a moment and pause and study God's word. And so I want to encourage you right now, however you're engaging us, just as you see this verse on the screen, maybe just take a moment. And even if this is maybe your first time in church and you might go, Jay, I don't, I don't know how to do that. Just read it and listen and pause. You know, we got so much noise in our world that a moment like this is kind of to kind of attune us to kind of what is important. And so I want to pray for that moment. And then we're going to go in and we're just going to watch about 30 seconds of, of some scripture. So let me pray. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you, God, that you are a real God and that you can bring peace in our life. And I pray that as we look at this verse, that you speak to each person that's engaging online right now from all around the world, that you speak to them and allow those words to sink into their life. And I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. opened our eyes and let us see it is faithfulness you've shown this is the God we know come on let's stand and sing when I cried out help me you turn your ears distressed in darkness Taken by fear, you grabbed my outstretched hand and you pulled me close. So, for all my days, it's your peace I hold. Let's sing, Oh God, oh God, you got in your ways, I hold. You've opened our eyes and let us 
is our God, the one who is faithful, the one who is consistent. That's the God we know. That's the God we sing to today. It's who you are who brought to life the dead dry bones. The God we know, the God we know who held back waters and calmed the storm.
That's our song today. We sing great. We sing great, are you, Lord? One last time, we declare. Great are you, Lord. Great are you, Lord. Yes, God, that's our prayer tonight. As we gather together, we recognize that you are great, you're powerful, you're mighty, you're wonderful. King Jesus, your name is the name that is above every name. You have taken our sin, nailed it to a cross. You've conquered the grave. You're crowned with glory as the high king of heaven. You have angels surrounding your throne, worshiped. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. So we recognize today your faithfulness. We recognize your goodness, your nearness, and we praise you. We praise you with our lips. We praise you with our hearts. We, we say that there is no one beside you. So please come and take your rightful place of worship in this house, in this church, Lord. And let our song be an aroma to your throne of joy and peace and love and adoration for you. And I pray, God, that you would bless us today, that you would open our eyes as we look at your word to see the beauty and the wonder of what is in this eternal book that you've given to us that has the power to change our lives today. We seal this moment in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. I want to say welcome to our campuses and all of you who are joining us online. Uh, and of course, the Lake Forest campus. We are in the third week of our message series called The Promise of Peace. And we've been looking at how God wants us to experience peace in our lives. And so often there's anxiety, worry, fear that fight against that peace. And we're looking at how do we step into that. But before we jump into today's message, I do want to make sure you know about one thing that's happening in just a few weeks. So on the weekend of May 19th, that is actually what is called Pentecost weekend in the church calendar. And for thousands of years, that day has been celebrated. It's actually the birth of the, the, the birthday of the church. And so on that day, in Acts chapter two, Peter spoke and preached a sermon, and 3,000 people gave their life to follow Jesus, and they all got baptized. And what we're gonna do on that weekend, Pentecost weekend, the birth of the church, almost 2,000 years old, we're gonna celebrate with baptism with literally thousands of churches all over the world. Uh, there was this big group of churches last year that did something called Baptize California, and this year it's baptized the world since we have international campuses. And so all of our campuses, that weekend, every service, we're gonna have one massive celebration of baptism. And there are some of you, maybe you've made that decision to follow Jesus and you've never gone public with that decision. This is a great opportunity with literally hundreds of thousands of other people that weekend to say, I'm a follower of Jesus, I wanna go public with my faith in him. So today, when you're taking your next steps, you can just say, I want to get baptized, and we'll follow up with you and help you take the step that weekend on May 19th on Pentecost weekend. It's going to be awesome. Now, for today's message, I want to just kind of zoom out and recognize how we've been focusing on the fact that we live in a culture where there's a war on peace. There's a war for the peace in our homes. There's a war for the peace in our hearts. And we've been recognizing throughout this series, what are those things that war against our peace? So I want you to see this little brief diagram that kind of breaks down some of the different aspects. Uh, we looked in the first week at how often in our culture we're confused about identity and who we are, and that unsure identity leads to a lack of peace. But there's an identity that God wants us to live from as sons and daughters of his, that when we put our trust in him, he changes us from the inside out gives us a new identity, and that becomes an anchor for our lives. So that was week number one. Last week, Stacy talked about chaos in our circumstances and how uncertainty often leads us out of peace. And so she talked about how unsure, chaotic circumstances aren't necessarily the reason to not live with peace. God can give us peace in chaos. This week, we're going to talk about the fear of the future. 
and how the future oftentimes with uncertainty, with fear, moves us out of peace. And then next week, we're going to look at broken relationships and how sometimes the broken relationships in our lives are bringing a tremendous amount of anxiety. And today, as we focus on the subject of fear, uh, I want to tell you about a book. This book uh, was written recently, and this book was all about the subject of fear. It's a guy by the name of Bernie Glasner, and the book is titled The Culture of Fear. And in this book, the author kind of takes a historical look at fear, and he goes back 100 years, and he says, if you go back 100 years, one of the things that you'll recognize is that the life expectancy a century ago was about half of what it is today. But when you look at people and culture as a whole, there's more fear today than there was 100 years ago or really any other time in human history. So we have more medicine, we have more ability to heal disease now than ever, but more fear than ever. And you've gotta ask the question, why? Why is there so much fear in our world? And he points out how, actually, there's a, a statistic that is fascinating. Um, in a recent 10-year period of history here in the United States, murder in the US went down by 20%, but murder stories on the news went up by 600%. Now that shows you that there's an agenda to keep us in suspense and fear. And you can look the last few years at what we've experienced in our culture as a whole going back to 2020 when COVID hit, the kind of fear that people were experiencing. And on the front end, not really knowing what's gonna happen with this virus and then people being stuck in their homes for long periods of time, some kids that didn't get around other kids for literally years on end and there's a social anxiety and you know, when people came out of COVID, it was do you elbow, do you fist bump, do you hug, what do you do? And all that social anxiety has resulted in a kind of fear in our world that so many people are living with. So many leaders, so many government officials, so many pastors and churches are living in fear. And that's not what God desires for our life. And today we're going to focus on how do you come out of and how do you face that fear? Well, in Isaiah 26, 3, the verse that we've been looking at through this series, it says this, you, Isaiah's speaking about God, you will keep in perfect peace him whose mind is steadfast because he trusts in you. And I want to pull a couple of things out of that verse for us today. I was talking to Pastor Buddy. Pastor Buddy is like a resident theologian here on staff, and I love it because I'll go in his office and talk about my sermons, and he gives me lots of good feedback. So he told me something this week that was really interesting about that word, mind. And I checked it out just to make sure he was right. He was right. And what he told me was that word mind literally means imagination. So when Isaiah is speaking, he says, you will keep in perfect peace him whose mind is steadfast, him whose imagination is steadfast, because he or she trusts in you. There's a steadfast of mind that comes from trust in God, but it's the imagination that so often wanders. The imagination goes in different directions, and it's important to see today that both fear, you might wanna write this down, both fear and faith have an imagination. Both fear and faith are contemplating the future. And what fear is doing is fear is contemplating a future without God while faith is contemplating a future with God and the faithfulness of God. And as we think about fear, the way that fear comes at us or comes from within us initially, there is a mechanism that God built inside of us when there's danger that rises up from within, like something is off here. This last week, Stacy and I, we went, um, hiking. We were in eastern Washington for a couple of days with some friends, and we're in the Cascade Mountains, and we're hiking, and somebody told me the day before we went out, like, oh, there, there were some bears in these mountains. And so when I went out, you know, I was like, well, I was a wrestler. I can take a bear. I know how to wrestle a bear. But the whole time, my, my eyes are up and alert, and alertness is okay. Like, that's, that, that's different than kind of being in a state of fear. But that alertness, there, there is an immediate reaction. If a bear came up on me, this, there would be danger. And so fear, oftentimes, the initial fear response is a response to immediate danger. And this is in your notes. It's a response to something that's coming at you 
that is a threat. And there's an alertness that jumps up. And God designed you to have a fight or a flight response to an immediate danger. So the bear comes and you either punch the bear or you run from the bear. And, you know, you get to decide what works. But that internal response is God's mechanism that's built in. But what happens with fear, I believe deeply inherent in the heart of fear is a demonic force that wants to restrict you from stepping forward into the life that God created you to live. That it is inherently to live in fear is coming straight from the pit of hell. And what fear does is as it creeps into our lives and it moves out of an immediate danger with a bear in front of you or some situation that needs a response, it actually gets our minds, the imagination of fear gets our minds into impending battles. And it's different than alertness because alertness is being ready for whatever comes at you. But the fear is when fear goes from your mind and it gets in you, not just on you, but in you, you can walk with a kind of way, we can walk with a kind of way that we're constantly worried about the battles that we're not even fighting. So we're leveraging so much of our strength and energy to fight a, a battle of something that's not even present in front of us so that when the actual battles that God brings our way that we need to fight in, we don't have the strength because we've been thinking, worrying in fear. So often we're fearful of impending battles. There's also imaginary problems. And maybe you've done this before, where in your mind, you're thinking about something and you're just imagining a problem. And sometimes it's comical even when you step back and you, you think about it for just a moment. Sometimes it's not comical when you think about the fear that people live with. And I remember when Stacy and I first got married, uh, we, were, we had a good friend of ours who got married just a couple of months before us. And after graduating from college, this good friend of mine his wife was on her way to work one day, got in a horrible car accident and lost her life. And I remember when I came into those first months of marriage and even years of marriage, my heart, any time I would hear an ambulance, my heart would immediately jump. My mind would go to scenarios. I would start planning and thinking and imagining and imagining my wife in the hospital, imagining her life being gone, all of these things just because I heard an ambulance. And maybe you've had a response like that. What fear does is it creeps in and it makes you imagine things. So fear has a focus and faith has a focus. And fear is focused on a future that's apart from the grace of God, apart from the faithfulness of God. It's a, it's a future that the enemy, that Satan is in control of, but faith has a focus on a future where God presides, where God is present. And today what I wanna do is I want to look at how do we get our minds to that place where we're focused on the thing that leads us through the fear. So fear lies to you. And what fear says is, it's really bad, you should do nothing. It's really bad, you should just wait and see if something happens. It's really bad, you should just step back from the scenario. And it's different than God's built-in mechanism with danger. So God's built-in mechanism is you respond to the situation. And there are so many people that are frozen in fear and never step into the fullness of the life that God has created them to live. And I want to ask you just to begin to identify what is that fear that you experience. Now, there are some fears that are kind of comical and some that are not. Like there's the fear of a plane crash. Maybe it's comical, maybe it's not, but the statistic is kind of crazy when you think about it. Did you know that the likelihood that you would get in a plane, act, plane crash and die is a point zero 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 one percent chance? That's really small. When it comes to heights, this is interesting, your chance of being injured by falling, jumping, or being pushed from a high place is one in 65,092. So that's, that's really not likely that you're going to fall off of a building. Lightning. How about this one? The odds of being struck by lightning is 1 in 2.3 million. And if you actually look at the odds at which you are likely to be hit by a meteorite, those odds are 1 in 700,000. So you are three times more likely to be struck by a meteorite than lightning. It's crazy. 
How about with dogs, okay? Their barking is often worse than their bite, right? So your chance of suffering a dog bite is 1 in 137,694, unless it's a chihuahua. And then it might, be, it might be a little bit higher. And if you have a chihuahua, God bless you. I like big dogs. Um, on the other hand, um, your chance of being injured, so you, you imagine how often you know, somebody gets afraid of dogs, but your chance of being injured while mowing the lawn is 1 in 3,623. So you can, you can see how often what fear does is it makes you focus on possibility, not probability. Here's another one, sharks. Um, you are, the likelihood that you will be bit by a shark and die is one in 300 million. But the likelihood that you will be killed by your spouse is one <laughs> in 135,000. So... Just amazing when you think about the odds of things, okay? Here's another one. Um, your chance of injury on a roller coaster is one in 300 million, but if you play with fireworks, you're really playing with fire, and your chance of injury is one in 20,000. So you can see how odds in our minds, the probability with fear, we lose the ability to think clearly. And what God's word does, what God does when he's working in us is he grounds us. And he gives us the ability to see our situation through probability, through reality, through his faithfulness, through the real danger that's there, through the things that are threats in our minds but are not real. He, he gives us the ability to move forward. And I want to focus today at a, on a wonderful passage of scripture found in the book of Joshua. And we're going to look at a guy who has a very clear conversation with God. And in this passage of scripture, what we're going to see is Joshua as he's receiving the baton of leadership for the nation of Israel, and he's following Moses. Now, if you ever want to follow a great leader, Moses is the one to follow. He's the one that wrote the first five books of the Bible. He's the one that brought the Israelites out of Egypt. He's like a modern-day, you know, ancient Rick Warren. Like, that's Moses. And Joshua shows up, and he's the leader. And God's going to call him out to lead the Israelites out of 40 years in the desert, wandering, no battles, seemingly a peacetime, into war, into the promised land, across the Jordan River with like a million people, and they're gonna have to take the land that God has promised to them. And God has a conversation with Joshua about the thing he needs as the leader in this moment where he's stepping into the promised land and the baton is being passed to him. Now notice what God says to Joshua. God says, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses ate. So this is God speaking to Joshua. Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then, you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I'm about to give to them to the Israelites. Now, this is important because Moses was certainly one that Joshua had relied on for confidence. So Moses, with his wisdom, with his strength, he would have given Joshua confidence. But he's gone. And God says, the thing that you relied upon is gone. And now there's going to have to be a new source of confidence for you. So Joshua, you're about to cross the land. I will give you every place your foot sets, as I promised Moses. Your territory will extend from the desert in Lebanon and from the great river, the Euphrates, the Hittite country to the great sea on the west. No one will be able to stand up against you all the days of your life. And as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. And I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. So God is speaking confidence into his son Joshua. He's saying, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be with you. You know going into this land, I've promised it to you. But there's one character trait that you must have as you lead these people. He says, be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their forefathers to give them. Notice again, he says one more time, be strong and very courageous, as if you didn't get it the first time. Be strong and courageous. Now it's be strong and very courageous. Now be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Don't turn from it to the right or to the left, that you might be successful wherever you go. 
Do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything that is written in it. And then you'll be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you? Now notice God the third time. It's like, okay, well, I said it once. I said it twice. I'm going to say it a third time, Joshua, if you didn't hear it. Have I not commanded you? 365 times in the Bible, God gives commandments about fear. Do not be afraid. Have I not commanded you, Joshua? Be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord, your God, will be with you wherever you go. And I want you to imagine this conversation because Joshua is hearing this through the filter of the fact that he's got to lead these people into the promised land. There's a massive rushing river. There's a million people, women, children, people who've never fought in war before and it's supposed to be an army. It's like now Joshua has to have the courage. He's saying, don't drip with fear as you lead these people. Stand with strength. Stand with courage. Now, there are several things that God is saying to Joshua about how to do this. And I want you to notice because God actually tells Joshua, this is how you, how you move forward. The character trait you need is strength and courage, but here's how. And the first thing I want us to see is that God is giving Joshua a commandment to know his word. And that's the beginning. For those of us who are followers of Jesus, the more we understand and know the word of God, the more it gives us strength to move into the future. Now, this is important for Joshua because Joshua, when God says to him, I want you to study and obey all the law, listen to what he says in verse six, be strong and courageous because you'll lead these people to inherit the land. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. So when Joshua gets this command from God, this would have been the book of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, the first five books of the Bible that Moses wrote called the Torah, and those first five books of the Bible, God says, I want you to be familiar with everything that is written in there. And as Joshua became familiar more and more with the the Bible, Joshua would have understood, one, the promises of God to go into the promised land that he gave to Abraham. He reaffirmed with Isaac and Jacob, so this, this promised land that God would bless a nation to bless the world, that ultimately Jesus would come through so that every nation could know the heart of God and have access to relationship with him through Jesus. God is doing something that is this eternal plan through the nation of Israel. Joshua would have had access to that. And not only would he have seen that, but he would have been able to see And even know from experience, but reading the Bible would remind him of all the things that God had done for the people of Israel leading up until this point. That this whole nation of people had been in slavery in Egypt, and God had performed miracle after miracle after miracle. In fact, God said, I brought you out with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. So every time Joshua would open that book and read it, he would become more familiar with the faithfulness and the power, the promises of God, and what would happen for him. And what can happen for us is the more I understand the word of God, the more I know what is in this book, it helps me pick my battles. It helps me know that this is one for you to engage in, and this is the one for you to let it pass. And there are so many things in in our world right now where people fight and bicker and argue, and it's sometimes in the midst of a polarized world, it's really hard to know what do you stand for? Like what's most important? So the Bible shows me God's values, and the Bible shows me what God blesses, and the Bible shows me how to live my life in a way that honors and pleases God. And we live in a culture right now that is removing the fight and the willingness to move forward in faith with courage and to stand for what is true and stand for what is right. So the more I know what God values, the more I know, oh, this is something I should engage in or this is something I should let pass. I'll say it like this on a personal level. I'm 42 years old, I have a 17, a 15 year old, and a 10 year old. 
I've been married to my wife for right at 21 years. And as I read the Bible, one of the things that I am increasingly convinced of is that God cares about multiple generations of people following him. And there are grandparents and parents and kids and generations come together and the home, the family, is God's primary vehicle or vessel for discipleship in the life of a person. And the more I study the Bible, the more I realize we live in a broken world and there are so many challenges and things that we fight, but God, in his design, puts a dad, a father with a mother who has sons and daughters, and in the home, the home is this vehicle where children are trained and loved and nurtured and invested in, and a dad is different than a mom. A dad protects. A dad fights for his family. A dad provides. A mom is a nurturer. She's a helper. They come together in this beautiful arrangement. And I understand there are some of you, I was raised by single parents. It's hard. And God takes up defense and cares for widows and moms that are raising kids on their own. So God comes in and steps in. But his original design is this family unit that he has blessed. And there is a war on the family in our culture. There is a war to tear down what God has said. I bless marriage and I bless families. And there's this mindset in our culture where parents, the, the world is teaching parents, you don't have the authority to raise your kids anymore. It's the education's job to raise your kids. It's the government's job to raise your, it's other people's jobs to raise your kid. Where if you are a parent and if you are a husband or a father, and what I am becoming deeply convinced of is the battle to win the heart of my wife and my three kids, it is a battle that is worth every ounce of energy that I could give to it. <clears throat> and what, what the enemy wants to breathe into our minds, wants to breathe into our minds, is you give your kids to somebody else to raise. Give them to a counselor. Not, not that counseling's bad, but give them to a counselor. Let a counselor straighten them out. Give them to the school system. Let a school system s straighten them out. When God designed us, if you're a mom or a dad, to be the primary vehicle that invests in the lives of our children. There's also so many things that are at war in, in the world around us where so many Christians, this is another angle to look at the war in our world right now. So many Christians are so hot and angry and frustrated with the world around them. But when you come to the message of Scripture and you look at how the Bible talks over and over and over and over and over again, but the character trait of God at his core being a God of love, that what should ooze out the life of a follower of Jesus is a life of love. So love is worth giving your life for. See, there are battles that God wants you to engage in. And what the enemy does is he convinces us often to live in fear, and as a result, we don't fight the fight that God calls us into. Peace is almost always on the other side of conflict. Peace is almost always on the other side of addressing something in our lives or in the world around us, and there's a call to courage, and Joshua's invitation to courage is to obey the Bible through knowing the whole Bible, through reading it. The second part of this is, is to obey it. So notice how God says back to Joshua, he says to him, be strong and courageous, be careful to obey all the law, my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left that you might be successful wherever you go. In your notes, I want to encourage you to circle the word obey all the law. So obey the law. And what God is saying to Joshua in this moment is that you know the Bible, but also it's obeying the Bible. It's obeying his word that keeps you moving forward. And what happens is when I obey the scriptures or God's word, it keeps my feet from getting stuck. It keeps me moving forward. So fear, at its core, is intended to neutralize you. I mean, this is at the core what terrorism is. Terrorism is to neutralize people so they do nothing, to live in a constant state of panic, doing nothing. And what God does is he wants to call you into confidence, call us into confidence through obedience. So if I know what God wants me to do, if I have a clear word from God, 
Obedience gives me, obedience moves me in that direction and fixes my eyes on the very thing that God is asking me to do rather than all the noise around me and all the threats, all the things that come at me, the cost of what it is around me, the cost of faith and the cost of fear are both present. And so I have to have those in my mind. So I wanna keep moving forward through obedience. Now, you might not be a follower of Jesus. The whole Bible thing doesn't really make sense to you. But let me say one really practical, sociological, psychological reality to fear. There's this concept called exposure therapy when it comes to fear. And, you know, we all have different things that we're fearful of, different phobias. I actually saw some research this week. I thought you would find this fascinating. Some of the phobias um, recently in our world. Number one is corrupt government officials. That's the top phobia right now. I don't know why, but you know, <laughs> it's pretty funny. Um, people who we love becoming seriously ill, um, nuclear warfare, people we love dying, a third world war, um, I don't know this one, pollution of drinking water, I guess that's number six. Um, not having enough money for the future, economic or financial collapse, um, biological warfare, all those are fears that we, we're living with in our world. But sometimes it's the fear of failure, sometimes it's the fear of what people think of you, but it can get stuck in our minds. And what exposure therapy says, so you just take for example, fear of spiders. My wife has a fear of cockroaches. It's very funny when a cockroach comes in. But I kill the cockroach because I love her. It's a battle worth fighting. So, um, but the, what exposure therapy says is if you can take something that you're afraid of, like a spider, part of moving forward is to actually allow your mind to think about that spider for just a second. And then next it might even be to draw a spider on a piece of paper and then it would be to be in the same room as a spider, and then it would be to take a step towards a spider, and then it would be to touch a spider, and all of this, what it's doing is it's showing you you can move forward. It's showing you you can keep taking steps in that direction. 90% of people with fears that are illogical, 90% of people that approach fear that way, they move out of it. And part of it is just the mindset that moving forward shows you that when you move forward, you're, you're gonna be okay. When you move forward and you take steps. But fear is actually a self-fulfilling prophecy in many ways in our life because the more we stay still, the bigger that fear becomes, the bigger the thing that we're obsessing over becomes in our life. So the call is to hear the voice of God for your life and know what it is that God wants you to do and to move in that direction. So there are multiple moments in my life where I felt like God was asking me to do something that required courage. Starting a church from scratch in the San Francisco Bay Area, moving from that church with my whole family to come to Saddleback, all of those moments required courage. And the question in each of those decisions for me is, God, what are you telling me to do? Because if you're telling me to go, there is a greater risk for me to stay put than to move. Because when I move forward in faith, there is a cost, but there's also a cost to me staying put in fear because I don't want to face the cost of moving forward by faith. And if I can, in my mind, recognize that the decision to do what God wants in my life, in the future, is always gonna come with a cost, but staying still comes with a cost. So I have to decide, do I want to take the cost of just staying still in fear or moving forward by faith? And for me, if I know from God, from his word, that God wants me to do something, that's what gives me the confidence to move my feet forward to know. If God told me to do it, like he told Joshua, he's already working in my tomorrow today. So his faithfulness is already there. He's already providing. He's already solving. He's already moving. And all he wants me to focus on is moving my feet, not to the right, not to the left. Don't choose. Move your feet straight towards the thing that he told you to do. So it's taking God's word, it's knowing it, and then obeying it that changes my perspective and helps me move forward. Now there's one last thing that I want to finish on. 
In addition to this is the ability not only to obey the word of God, but it's my decision to speak God's word over my own life. So notice how God says to Joshua, do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth, meditate on it day and night so that you might be successful, so that you might be careful to do everything written in it, then you'll be prosperous and successful. Now notice that progression, because God says to Joshua, I first want you to speak it, and then I want you to meditate on it. And what he's saying is that the more you speak the word of God, the more you'll think the word of God. So the more it's in your conversation, the more you're quoting it over your life, the more you're saying it over yourself, it's realigning, it's renewing my thoughts. It's renewing our mind back in the direction of the life that God is inviting us into. Out of fear, into peace. Out of fear, into faith. So that realignment of my thought is the invitation. This last week, I said I went for a hike. I also went for a bike ride. And my buddy, who lives in eastern Washington and always goes mountain biking, says to me, hey, how good are you at mountain biking? I'm like, I'm good. I'm good. It's been 10 years, but I'm good. And so he took me out, and he said, I'm so glad I'm riding on a mountain bike with somebody who's good at mountain bikes. And he's like, let me show you this mountain. 3,000 feet up, all the way down. I'm good. So I did it. I spilled, and I like went off the track and crashed seven times, but I did it. And I'm here. I'm here today to show you. I made it. So as I'm riding the bike, though, I'm, I'm noticing the tire, you know, the tire that kept going off, off the path. I'm noticing that alignment is actually never a straight line. So if you think about a tire that moves forward, it's never always pointed exactly in the right direction. It's constantly realigning that to move in the direction that you're supposed to go. And that's why the Bible is so powerful and important. Because as we saw earlier this year as a church family, that when you open this book, which is the authoritative word of God for your life. God speaks through the Holy Spirit into your life, leads and guides and directs. And every time I receive from this book, my courage and my strength grows. And God gives me a kind of strength that's not based on my ability or my wisdom, but he gives me, he gives you a strength based upon who he is. So what I wanna do is I have found that when I get verses from the Bible and I put them on a card in my pocket or I put them in my mind and I say them in conversation, that every time I do that, I'm strengthening my courage. And I wanna read a couple of these verses over you that have been helping me in the last couple of weeks and I can't tell you all the scenarios in my life that they're helping me with, but I want you just to feel the power of God's word over your life, over our church. Psalm 91. King David is writing about God and he says this, he who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. And then he takes it and he makes it personal. There's a power when you make the word of God personal. I will say to the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. So whatever scenario I'm in, whatever circumstance, he's a refuge, he's a fortress. Joel 2.25, the enemy who's a liar is breathing threats over you about your past, trying to bring regret and shame over moments that you've lost. And the word of God speaks of his face towards his children. He says this, so I will restore to you the years that the swarming locusts have eaten crawling locusts, consuming locusts, and the chewing locusts. My great army which I sent among you, you shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God and praise the name of the Lord your God who's dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never be put to shame. Oh, the power of God's word, when you get it in your heart and you get it in your mind 
And you say, oh, there are, there's, there's moments in my life that the locust, that pain, that sorrow, that regret has destroyed. But I know that there is a God who has dealt wondrously towards me. And he's already in my future. He's already in my tomorrow, working out with love and kindness and mercy, circumstances that I can't control. He's faithful. He's good. Psalm 23, verse 4 and 5 says, even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil for you, my God, are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil and my cup overflows. And whatever you're walking through right now, that image that King David gives, he's saying, I'm a, I'm a sheep next to a shepherd. But I'm next to a shepherd that is the sustainer and the creator, the one who formed the heavens, who, who loves me and is with me, and he's got a rod and staff, and he's comforting me as we go along, and he's putting before me a table in the presence of my enemies, proving that he's with me, showing me by anointing my head with oil, and in every circumstance, my cup is overflowing because he's with me. So I'll walk in confidence, even in the darkest valley of my life. 1 John chapter 4, this is the last one I'm going to leave you with, and maybe you can get these and memorize them or even think about them throughout the course of this week. 1 John 4, 18 speaks of the Spirit of God and says this, there is no fear in love, but perfect love, the work of God, perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment, the one who fears is not made perfect in love. Let me read it one more time. There is no fear in love, but God's perfect love drives out fear. And here's why this, this is so important. The God who made you, the God who formed you, the God who knows you is the same God that made every star in the sky. He's the same God that spoke creation into existence. He's ruling and reigning with power and authority. He's high in the heavens and he's near here on earth through the power of the Holy Spirit. There's nothing that can stand against him. There's no one that is greater than him. And he is, for those of us who've put our trust in King Jesus, who've surrendered our lives to him, he's, he's with us, he's for us, he's making a way, his spirit is in us. So when I get to tomorrow, the very thing that I fear, the impending battle and the problem that's in my mind, God, with his perfect love, is already working it out on my behalf. So I can walk with confidence and let that perfect love deep in my soul, deep in our souls, drive out the fear. He's with you. He's for you. Now, there's one fear that perhaps is the greatest fear that so many people live with, and it's the fear of death. And the reason why I think we all deal with this is because we, we all know people, we all have seen people that hit that point. And it's, it's the impending reality for all of us that death is in front of us. And the question of what happens in that moment where you breathe your last breath here on planet Earth is, is such an important question to wrestle through. When this life is over, what happens? And the Bible tells us that we all stand before a holy and righteous God in that moment that we breathe our last breath here on planet Earth. And our decision, what we've done with the message of Jesus, is ultimately the eternal destiny of our soul forever based upon whether or not we received by faith what Jesus did on a cross for our sins. So Jesus, the Son of God, God in human flesh, came, lived among us. He lived a perfect, sinless life. He died on a cross, stretched his arms out wide, was placed into a grave, and came forth victorious three days later, conquering the grave, alive. He's ruling and he's reigning. And he's inviting you into friendship with him. If you've never received that perfect love into your heart, today can be the day, friend, that you open your heart to the God who's knocking on the door of your heart. That perfect love. There's nothing in this world. That's why it's perfect love, because there's a bunch of imperfect kinds of love in this world. But his love, his perfect love, drives out fear. Because if the fear of death is removed, and the fear of eternity is gone, and the creator of the universe is with you and for you, nothing can stand 
against you. I want to invite you to close your eyes and bow your head with me. And there's just a couple of invitations I have as we're closing in prayer. Those of you who maybe there's a fear that you've been holding on to. It could be fear, something with your kids, fear of maybe an illness that you either have or you're worried about getting, fear of perhaps your marriage or something related to your career or your finances or loneliness. There, there's so many that just come to our minds. I want to invite you right now as we're with eyes closed and head bowed between you and the God of the universe, I just want to ask you to bring that fear before him. And I want to ask him to, I want to ask you to just invite him to speak into that fear with his perfect love. What would he say to you? What would he say? He would tell you he's with you. He'd tell you that he's for you. He'd tell you that he's going to give you everything that you need. And I want you just to imagine with me you dropping that fear at the feet of Jesus. And I want you to imagine him, through the power of the Holy Spirit, filling you with courage in this moment. He's given you courage to fight the battle he's asking you to fight. He's giving you strength to stand in confidence. He's giving you the ability right now to go face that addiction, to go chase the heart of your wife, to go pursue the hearts of your children, to work towards purity. He's given you the courage to acknowledge something that you've done in the past. He's giving you courage to believe that he's with you and for you. God, thank you that you pour courage into our lives. I pray you pour it out into our whole church everywhere right now in this moment. Others of you, perhaps right now you recognize eyes closed, you've never made a decision to trust in Jesus and today is the day of your salvation. I wanna invite you right now just to say, God, I need you. I'm choosing right now the best I know how to surrender to you. And I wanna give you my whole heart. I give you my life in this moment. And as you do, God is stepping in. He's making you new. He's changing you from the inside out through the power of the Holy Spirit. And Father, we thank you today that you are a God of love, that you did not give us a spirit of timidity or fear, but love, power, and a sound mind. Make us bold. Make us courageous. Make us confident in a world that is filled with fear. Make your people bold, God. Make us men and women who stand with courage for what you value. Make us men and women that care deeply about those in our life that don't know you. God, make us people of peace because our confidence is in you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. What a powerful message about facing our fears. And I want to encourage you right now, as Pastor Andy was praying that prayer and talking about facing your fears, you might be going through something. And I just want to encourage you, scan that QR code or click the link in the description and go to check in and share a prayer request. Our team, we, we have hundreds of people that pray for our prayer requests every week. And we want to make sure we add your prayer requests by name to that list. And so go there add your prayer requests and let us know what's going on in your world. It's private, don't worry about that. And uh, also there, when you go there, there's a bunch of other next steps that you can take. Like you can sign up for Activate that's happening April 28th or May 3rd on Zoom. You can get into an online group and so much more, but it starts with you pulling out your phone, uh, downloading, accessing the Saddleback Church Companion app, or you know, doing it right there in the link in the description. We wanna make sure we are praying for you and offering uh, everything that our online community offers. Our church is much more than just this worship service. You can actually engage in community. We also have a couple things there. If you go to what's happening, we have uh, online support groups with depression and anxiety and pain and medical groups that uh, I would love to get you plugged into if that's something you struggle with. We also have a Celebrate Recovery online group about maybe there's something deeper you're going through and you need some deeper support. We have a, a Zoom option every Wednesday and you can get that all on the digital program. Uh, something else I just want to highlight is uh, this amazing story. And uh, we've talked about this uh, in previous months, but this kind of, and I bring this up because this comes out of your generosity. When you give to Saddleback Church, when you give a tithe or offering, uh, there's so many amazing things that happens when we pull our resources together as a church. And one of those things is our Davao extension in the Philippines. And uh, an amazing uh, leader, Ian, 
uh, who leads this and it kind of comes out of our Santa Rosa extension in the Philippines. And uh, they recently uh, just celebrated two year anniversary, but they recently just had Activate that they host. Now, it's important to understand our extensions are volunteer gatherings of people that watch service together in a home or a venue. And so there's no staff there. This is all volunteer led. And so they had at their two year anniversary about 100 people gather. And when they host Activate themselves, they had 36 people show up. Uh, and you're seeing a photo right now. Uh, how amazing is that? And I just want to let you know that is only possible because of your giving, because of your generosity. When you give to our church, you're not only supporting our campuses, but you're supporting online, you're supporting all of our extensions. That happens because of your generosity. So I just wanna say thank you, Saddleback. You are such a generous church, and it's amazing what we get to do as a global church. This is one of the, my favorite things about our church is that we're not just a church in Southern California. We have a location in Hong Kong, in Argentina, in Canada, in Germany, uh, in the Philippines. And this is something that God is moving everywhere and even in our extensions and our volunteer gatherings. So thank you so much for being a generous community. And you can give right now by going to saddleback.com slash give, or you can go to the digital program and you can give uh, there as well. Well, we are going to be wrapping up the Promise of Peace series next week. Make sure you send this to a friend who needs to hear this message of facing a fear. Maybe bring somebody back for next week, but we will see you right here next week.